Excellent, thank you very much indeed. And it is a huge pleasure and an enormous privilege to be here tonight at this very auspicious uh, venue and this very auspicious occasion. I'd like, first of all, on your behalf, to thank Graham very much indeed. Yeah. Not, yeah. Only, yeah. not only for his kind hospitality, but also for giving us such an informative and interesting account of this uh, very uh, famous building. Uh, it is a very special um, occasion for me, as I shall explain, because obviously we are here principally to honour uh, the forthcoming 89th uh, anniversary of the birth of the greatest uh, uh, female, I think, that has served our country, certainly uh, in the last uh, century or so. Uh, we are here to honour Margaret Thatcher, who has uh, done so much for our country. Uh, but we are also, of course, uh, in this extraordinary, uh, famous uh, venue. Uh, and it, as you've heard, it was from here that one of the most extraordinary aerial exploits ever undertaken uh, was launched. And it was led by an extraordinary man, Wing Commander Guy Gibson, Victoria Cross, Distinguished Service Order, Distinguished Flying Cross and Bar. And you've just heard that he died at the age of 26, a wing commander at the age of 25. Absolutely astonishing. And was described as, uh, by Sir Arthur Harris uh, as, as great a warrior as these islands ever bred. And so what a night for all of us. Margaret Thatcher uh, and Arthur Harris and Guy Gibson. Uh, what a combination. What a panoply of heroism. Uh, for our country. Uh, and the, um, the mention of Arthur Harris is quite um, amusing because uh, some of you may remember uh, that at one time he was um, not exactly flavour of the month. <laughs> uh, and indeed, after the Second World War, uh, there was uh, almost a campaign of um, de denial about saturation bombing. Mm -hmm. uh, and Arthur Harris bore the brunt of that. Uh, I was brought up in Hamburg. Uh, and after the, uh, after the war, and I witnessed the devastation that had been caused. But I can tell you this, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that it did herald the end of the war, it hastened the end of the war against a very vicious enemy. Uh, and so I do think uh, history will have to uh, be more careful in how it reflects on what was done by Bomber Command and the 55,563 men who gave their lives uh, on operations, including the 56 uh, from um, Operation Chastise. Um, but I, um, my story is that, um, if you remember, they unveiled a statue uh, outside St. Clement Danes, the Royal Air Force uh, Church in, uh, in the Strand. Yeah. And uh, I had, uh, I was Margaret Thatcher's parliamentary private secretary, which I was. Um, so I, mean, I was only there after she lost office. Of course, if I'd been chosen as her parliamentary prime secretary before she lost office, she'd still be there now. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't to be. But I remember saying to her, I said, now what are you doing this weekend, Margaret? And she said, well, actually, DT, she was one DT, DT and I were going to go to uh, St. Clement Danes. They're going to unveil her. her her Majesty, uh, uh, the, the Queen Mother, is going to unveil a memorial to Sir Arthur Harris. So we thought we'd just, you know, go and sort of join the crowd. I thought, oh my so God. <laughs> <laughs> if they're sort of going to go and mingle at the back of the... Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this, this will spell a, um, a kind of PR disaster. So I rang Jonathan Aitken, who was then the... Um, one of the MOD ministers and told Jonathan what she and Dennis were proposing to do and uh, he said thank you very much for telling me Gerald and of course as a result uh, she and Dennis were on the front uh, row of the pews in the church and uh, given the proper place that, um, that, 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 uh, that she warranted but of course that was testimony to her refusal to to uh, accommodate any form of political correctness. Mm -hmm. She knew jolly well that Arthur Harris was not flavour of the month, but she was jolly well going to nail her colours to the mast, as she always did, and go along and salute a great hero of the United Kingdom. So, 
Uh, it is uh, uh, particularly um, uh, interesting uh, to be here, um, also because my mother was a plotter during the Second World War. No, she was also a plotter of other descriptions. <laughs> she used to march with the London Dockers against immigration. <laughs> Pity people didn't listen to her then. Yeah. Instead of despising her, including her friends in the village. Oh, well, you know, Mary's a bit odd. <laughs> yeah, well, Mary knew exactly what it was all about. And she stood up for what she believed in. But um, you heard uh, mention made of uh, the, the ops from there just to below us, and uh, of course the plotters were receiving the information uh, from the, the radar stations, and of course we didn't acknowledge we had radar, our pilots um, were so able to see it because they, as you know, they, um, they, they, they had a diet of carrots, and that improved their eyesight enormously <laughs> over the Germans. Uh, but of course we had the chain home and all the rest of it. And, um, these, these WAFs would be um, at the table pushing these blocks of wood across the North Sea, representing bandits, the enemy, uh, and of course the, um, the warriors going out to do battle. Uh, she wrote a fantastic account of it, fantasized it, um, but sadly nobody has ever thought fit to publish it. Um, that may change, uh, who knows. But uh, so for me, um, the, the, the product of a union between a WAF and a Royal Air Force officer um, with a very special um, appreciation of Guy Gibson, who is my hero, as Margaret was, uh, I have to say that this is a very special occasion for me and I'm very thrilled and honoured to be here tonight. Uh, look, I have prepared a few notes because the worst thing with a politician is, you know, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I hadn't time to make a, to prepare a short speech. Uh, so, um, I hope it won't be rambling, um, but I, I did, did put some notes together because I think it's so important that we do record and do remember Margaret Thatcher's uh, achievements. Because not, her premiership was not just uh, so seminal for our country, it was the longest. She was the longest serving Prime Minister since Lord Liverpool, who served from uh, 18, uh, 1812 to 1827. And she has not been beaten by Blair. Do you remember? Mm. Blair yeah, got yeah, pushed yeah. out just, to, just before he was going to get, um, get uh, to overtake her. So uh, we saw him off, I think uh, we might have said. Um, but uh, um, there was a wonderful story about, uh, about that, which, to which I am the only person who was party. We were milling around the back of the chamber in the House of Commons um, uh, during a vote. And you've probably seen all the telly and there's a lot of confusion and chaos. But anyway, this guy comes up to him and says, Maggie, can I have a word with you? She says, yes, of course. He said, Mike, I just want to tell you, you're not just the, the longest serving Prime Minister since Lord of Liverpool, you're the best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course she loved this. Uh, she had no idea who she's talking to. So I said, you do know that Senso is a, is a Labour MP, uh, is a historian. Yes, of course. He said, it wasn't I agree with what you did. Uh, you know, I didn't agree at all, but I was so impressed with your determination, your resolution, your, your stuck to your guns anyway. She, he banged on like this, she loved every minute of it. Um, and the only, he said, Margaret, she's got tell you, he's just fucking brilliant. <laughs> I, can, I can only say in the vernacular, as I heard it. Uh, before we have uh, Peter here, who is a historian, and it would be quite wrong for me uh, not to give the historical fact. And then she turned to walk away, he said, and he got a fantastic pair of legs. <laughs> it's a true story. Um, but it is, of course, it was a it was a win win because uh, she knew that uh, she was the uh, woman the longest serving, and she knew she had stuck to her guns. She also knew she had a pair, pair of legs as well. <laughs> I mean, Margaret Thatcher was always very feminine, uh, and uh, she was not a harridan. She was a uh, a wonderfully feminine uh, lady. But in uh, recognizing her determination, of course, that is one of the things. Uh, that characterised her st stewardship of this country. I think there were three main characteristics. Uh, the rescue of the British economy from post-war terminal decline. Many of us here went through uh, the 70s. We were even stocking uh, sugar in our flat in Chiswick after we got married 40 years ago. Um, so dire was the situation, out of which was born the National Association for Freedom uh, with Ross McWhorter, late, of course, assassinated by the IRA. 
Uh, and we have Norman Tebbett and I, we had all planned, as I shall say next year, we had all planned to um, produce a newspaper which Norman and I were going to arrange to be delivered by air around the country. So she rescued the British economy. Secondly, she restored Britain's place in the world. And thirdly, she had this absolute total commitment and belief in the freedom of the individual. So what was her economic strategy? Well, I think it's worth reminding ourselves so that we can remind others, not least of the, those who form our present government. Uh, that belief in the freedom of the individual was uh, really overwhelming in her and drove her. But it was accompanied by a very keen sense that your freedom was matched by an obligation. Uh, that uh, freedom didn't come on its own and you had an obligation to, and a responsibility to look after your family uh, and your lives. And if you remember, she said there is no such thing as society for which she was criticised. What she meant was, society is an amorphous body. Society is made up of individuals. It is individuals who give. It's you who have just given to this charity. And uh, you know the significance of Chadwick. Chadwick is the man who designed the Lancaster bomber. And he is also the man who designed my aeroplane, the Vulcan bomber, X-ray Hotel 558. See it at the air displays next year. And I'd like to give to that, be wonderful. Um, and Roy Chadwick designed both of those aircraft. And look at the difference between the, the, the Vulcan and, uh, and the Lancaster. 11 years separated the first flight of each of those aeroplanes. So I'm delighted, Graham, that it's called the Chadwick. Uh, trust, because I think that that recognises a man who contributed so much. So, uh, she was driven by belief in it, it, individual freedom, and where did that manifest itself? Well, it particularly manifested itself in the trade union business, because we had seen that the trade union members were being, uh, being dragooned by their leaders, who drove around in smart cars, commanded uh, salaries way in excess of those which their members uh, uh, were paid, and they lived off the back of their members, and they imposed a tyranny on their members. Yeah. Hands up those who remember the closed shop. Yeah. Roger, I see you've got his hand up. Very good. Is it a closed shop in the UK? I can't remember. No, you're welcome to join. Oh, oh, as, I, as I tell my UK people in Farm Row on Thursday nights, unfortunately, you know, I got there before they did. Anyway, they're too left wing for me. <laughs> But, uh, but the closed shop, that system under which you could not get a job unless you were already admitted into a trade union, that applied to the National, to, to the National Union of Journalists, it applied to actors, it applied across the board. It was a tyranny. She ended it. Uh, we tamed the, the, uh, the trade union barons uh, who were holding the country to ransom. And we restored the trade unions to uh, uh, their members. And, of course, don't forget, stopped secondary picketing which was a real blight on our country and a complete abuse of uh, trade union uh, power. And she reduced the role of the state. Uh, uh, if you remember, in 19, uh, 1970 they had the Selston, uh, the meeting at Selston Park Hotel where the Conservative Party was going to come out at last after the post-war um, uh, flirt was, was quasi-socialism. We were really going to go out and privatise things. Well, boys and girls, we did a great thing. Ted Heath. In 1970, he privatised the pubs in Carlisle. <laughs> My God, was the world a new place. A brave new world of privatisation. We didn't go much further than that, but there we go. She did. And she undertook uh, something like 50 privatisations during her administration. And the result of that was that these ailing industries, which were consuming vast amounts of taxpayers' money, accounted for 10% of gross domestic product, accounted for 8% of employment and 14% of investment. These industries, which were sucking out money from the taxpayer, suddenly were transformed and just giving money to the taxpayer. And in 2012, BT, remember, the successor to the general post office? And any of you had a party line in your homes? Yeah. yeah, we had a party line. That was when you had a shared line with your neighbour and when you picked up the phone, yeah. uh, you had to check your neighbour wasn't on the phone. Uh, and um, so we transformed all of that, enabled socialists to have uh, mobile phones uh, and salaries to go with the Armani suits, you know, and all of that. And in 2012, BT contributed £2.45 billion to the Exchequer. We need to ram the message home. 
that this belief in free enterprise isn't an ideology, it is a belief in the people. It's a belief that we can release the talents of the British people, which is what she, uh, she did. Um, and she herself said it was one of the central means of reversing the corrosive and corrupting effects of socialism. <laughs> Privatisation is at the centre of any programme of reclaiming territory for freedom. So there we have it. Uh, that is my theme tonight, uh, Margaret Thatcher and the defence of freedom. Everything she did was based on a core philosophy, a fundamental belief in freedom. Council House sales, remember? What I didn't know until I did a little bit of research before tonight was that council house sales were actually pioneered by Horace Cutler, who was chairman of the housing committee of the Greater London Council. And a very great man. He's the man actually who sold London Bridge to the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they thought they were getting Tower Bridge. He never let on. Um, but he started, he started that. 7,000 were sold in 1970. 1972, 45,000 council houses uh, were sold. And ultimately, of the six million council houses, two million uh, were sold. And if I, in this audience, may be bold enough to say that Michael Hesseltine uh, said, uh, no single piece of legislation has enabled the transfer of so much capital wealth from the state uh, to the people. Uh, and, you know, we've all seen it. We've seen all, do you remember all those, um, those socialist councillors who brazenly took advantage of the right to buy, bought, released themselves from the tyranny they'd imposed on all their neighbours, uh, and bought their own homes. Marvellous. Greater joy in, is there in heaven over the one sinner that repenteth than over the ninety and nine that have no need of repentance. Not that I'm suggesting we're all perfect, but uh, some of you have got room for improvement. Roger, Roger Helmer. <laughs> I couldn't resist that, Roger. You're welcome. Um, but, um, uh, so, domestically, I just remind you uh, of, of what she achieved. And it was achieved against a real um, pressure not to go this far. The No Turning Back group was formed. They call us the, no, the Don't Turn Your Back group for some obscure reason. <laughs> well, the No Turning Back group, which I'm sure is alive and well under the uh, stewardship of my lookalike John Redwood. Um, those who say uh, we look rather like, I say we come from the same planet. <laughs> and I'm wearing the badge. <laughs> but um, uh, we were set up to, uh, to, to, to encourage Margaret to go ahead with the foot on the accelerator. Because the, all those siren voices are steady off, you know, we not, we've done a bit, we must now sort of draw back. No, press home the advantage, we said. She did. Uh, she didn't really need a lot of encouragement, but we gave it to her nevertheless. Um, now, of course, other thing I mentioned earlier about what she achieved, she restored Britain's place in the world. And it's very important to understand that that had economic value. It wasn't just an ideological thing. It was certainly not a xenophobic thing. It was because she knew that trade follows the flag. Now, if you've got a tattered flag, no, they ain't going to follow that, are they? So she flew the Union Jack proudly and defiantly uh, over Whitehall and over this country. And the Iranian embassy siege, which we all uh, uh, remember, was the first visible manifestation of this Iron Lady uh, in action. Uh, she was not going to tolerate it, and she was going to let uh, the men and women of the armed forces uh, have um, uh, been released into action. And it's, um, of course, uh, uh, ever since the Iranian embassy siege, she, is always, she was always a very uh, welcome uh, visitor to, uh, to Hereford. And then the Falklands campaign. Well, I'm not going to say anything about the Falklands campaign tonight, uh, save to remind you that 255 men gave their lives in that campaign. Um, but it was her resolution, uh, and very interesting talking to one of the military commanders ten years later when we had a, a reception at the Imperial War Museum, which she kind of invited me to join her and Dennis. Um, she, uh, um, one of the commanders there said to me, I said, what well, was it like? He said, it was amazing. She said, can you do it? We said, yes, taking a bit of a gamble, uh, weren't sure if we could. She said, go to it, and she didn't interfere. She didn't try and micromanage the military operation. So the military commanders were given their head. We all know the result. All I want to say, though, is that um, it has been one of the most um, extraordinary privileges I have had 
uh, with, with Lizzie, uh, my wife, is to attend, uh, well, I went on a pilgrimage um, 20 years later, in uh, 2002, to the Falklands with Surgeon Commander Rick Jolly, who manned the red and green life machine, from which no man who arrived alive left other than alive. So no one died in that, despite the fact that missiles entered the building, uh, never exploded. Who said there isn't a God? And uh, the, uh, it, it was an extraordinary experience, and she came to see us off uh, at, uh, at Gatwick um, with Jim Davidson. And they were just, uh, all these men, maimed, injured, mines destabilized, had nothing but absolute admiration for their commander-in-chief who had sent them there. And it was the same at Greenwich. There was a, there was a, uh, there was a dinner for the, those who had, um, had received awards at the, uh, in the Falklands campaign. And we were invited, um, uh, and we were on, up on the, the dais and the painted hall there, those of you who know it. A magnificent place. So it was full of these guys. Anyway, Princess Anne was there. Uh, with her husband, and uh, she left just before the end of the proceedings. And then, uh, first of all, there was an American general there, who was the uh, first general to command um, Basra, uh, um, Baghdad, after after the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the the war. And uh, he said to me yeah, after the 2003 war, he said, he said uh, "Do you think I could uh, shake hands with uh, with Margaret Thatcher?" Uh, and I said, "General, I'll see what I can do. Ask Mark Worthington." William Foster said, yeah, just make sure as she comes out, the general, uh, the, the, the general, you know, push him. So I said, okay. So Margaret comes out. So I said, general, get there. <laughs> so there's me ordering an American general. <laughs> I'd rather enjoy it, I have to say. Uh, and, um, and see this man with tears in his eyes. A hard-bitten American general with tears in his eyes at the opportunity of shaking hands with Margaret Thatcher. That tells you something as well. But it was as she then left, and she got to the top of the steps. Bear in mind, many of these men were maimed, mental injuries, etc. The moment she stood on the top of the steps, you could have heard the roof go off. They just stood up and roared. They did it when she came to Aldershot, to one power, um, to commemorate the uh, anniversary. And obviously, as a member of Parliament Aldershot, I was there. And again, all these guys, fag, Fagging one end, pint of beer in the other. Many had uh, left the uh, uh, left the army, and uh, Farah Hockley uh, was there, and, and David Cooper did a, uh, um, a drumhead service, and then uh, Dad Farah Hockley said, um, "I wonder if I might now invite um, Lady Thatcher to say a few words." Again, the roof just blew off. They will not do that to Tony Blair. <laughs> <laughs> She believed in a sovereign nation state. That's what drove her. She believed in our country. She was. I, met, I once had the, the, the temerity to suggest, well, going to the uh, 1997 generation, we don't want to wrap ourselves too much in the Union flag. God, I wish I'd never said it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, Gerald? Wrap yourself in the Union flag. What's wrong with that? <laughs> so I got um, one of my many handbagging, so I'm still taking the bits out. <laughs> Didn't manage to duck a few times, but not on that occasion. But she believed in the sovereign nation state, and she was never afeared of expressing that view. Do you remember when Ronald Reagan invaded Grenada? She was apoplectic. And uh, word came to the White House that the, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom was going to get on the phone. Uh, and they were all quite scared, and Bob Tuttle, who was the ambassador in London, was there at the time and told, them, told me what it was actually like. They were all really rather afeared for the, for the president. Um, the phone call came through, the doors of the Oval Office shut, and about 15 minutes of conversation, you're going to hear a few voices being raised, etc. Uh, and uh, they were very worried about the president's condition after this uh, um, <laughs> handbagging down the telephone. And of course she was handbagging, she said, who do you think is the head of state of Grenada? <laughs> her Majesty the Queen! <laughs> you, you need her permission! <laughs> I mean, it was all of that. Anyway, so of course they were all this, you know, his staff all very white. Anyway, after, after all this, the doors open. They're very apprehensive. The doors open. There's Ronald Reagan, beaming from ear to ear, 
and all he said was, what a magnificent woman. <laughs> <laughs> so she believed in a strong, uh, in a strong nation state, uh, and she believed in strong defense. And uh, if, if you have a look at um, what she did um, in, in Jeffrey Howe's first budget, very interesting. Do you remember he cut the top rate of tax from 83% to 60%? Abolished exchange controls at a stroke. Cut the basic rate of tax from 33 to 30% with the object of getting down to 25%. All of that done against uh, uh, the kind of desperate economics uh, that we inherit from uh, gang Labour government. Churchill did it in 51, she did it in 79, and Cameron did it in 2010. Uh, but despite that, I have to say, she did increase members of parliament pay by 75%. <laughs> Not many people made that, and you won't read that in the Daily Telegraph. You won't read that in the Daily Telegraph, I can tell you. <laughs> did you get it? <laughs> but but he, she also increased expenditure on defence by £100 million. And bearing in mind the deficit then was £10 billion. In 2010 it was £156 billion. You know, it wasn't to be sneezed at. But of course, the EU was her, her, her key battleground. Um, and I'm sure you remember that famous interview with Robin Day. Uh, do you remember when she, uh, um, she was trying to get the rebate uh, back? Mm -hmm. and, um, and Robin Day sat there on News and asked her this convoluted question, you know, the Prime Minister, isn't it going to uh, you know, upset our European allies and this will not do the United Kingdom any good, we will not be able to have it. And she listened to all this. And then she leaned forward, and I look at Donald mm. Blaney as I say this. <laughs> she leaned forward and said, But Robin, it's our money. We want it back. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely crystal clear. And as a result, £74 billion pounds came back. As William Hague reminded those who criticised the arrangements for her funeral last year. Uh, it was a small compensation. Uh, that the state should pay for something uh, uh, where she had uh, given the state effectively 74 billion of its own money back. Um, and there was one um, that she didn't confine her belief in the sovereign nation state to the United Kingdom. Uh, she went to, to France on one occasion. At the time, do you remember when the French were having, uh, uh, the, we, we had the, um, uh, the uh, well, the town of Maastricht, and they were, um, the question was whether France should have a referendum or not. And I said, what are you doing next weekend, Margaret? She said, well, I'm going to Paris. I'm going to have dinner with Mitterrand. And, uh, and then she said, I'm going to tell him that France signs the Mastery Treaty. I'm going to tell him, France est more. I said, well, actually, um, it's la France. Yes, of course. La France est more. I said, well, actually, because it's feminine, you have to say, you have to pronounce the T. So, La France est morte. So she went round the room in, 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 uh, uh, in Cheshengard's uh, face, going, La France est morte, La France est morte. She went to uh, dinner with Mitterrand, told him, La France est morte, if you sign the, the, uh, the Master of Treaty. On Monday, Mitterrand announced France would hold a referendum. <laughs> and they won it by half a percentage point. So uh, there you go. Um, she didn't just confine, I believe, the sovereign nation state uh, to the uh, uh, United Kingdom. And of course on the Single European Act, which I voted against, there are only four of us left in the House of Commons who voted against it, 44 did at the time, four of us left, I'm the only Tory. Uh, the, other, the other three are Jeremy Corbyn, Dennis Skinner, and uh, so I'm in good company. Uh, and uh, and uh, Nick Rainsford, funnily enough. Um, uh, I keep reminding Nick every time I see him uh, that he was once son. <laughs> but she believed, I said that saying to you, uh, when we were driving to House Commons on occasion, I said that saying to you, Margaret, that your criticism is unfair because you've signed the Single European Act, which gave way to this qualified majority of voting. And she said, yes, but I was told that it would not apply to anyone except uh, to the provision of goods and services. And it was as a result of that betrayal by the system, overwhelmingly, of course, by the European Court of Justice, and its, its, its contemptible acquis communautaire. If you go that contemptible acquis communautaire. Um, as a result of all that, uh, that's why she went, um, she went so uh, absolutely determined to resist any further incursion by, the, uh, by, the, by Europe, because she'd been betrayed. 
She'd been told it would not apply to everything else, and it did. Um, I have voted against it, of course, because I never uh, knowingly voted for anything European if I could avoid it. Um, but there we go. Uh, I'm afraid I um, ha haven't changed my spots, um, or I'm, I'm um, a dinosaur, as I read on the, um, on the Twitter, uh, the, in the Twitter sphere. Well, you call me what you like, uh, but you're either right or wrong, and I believe I am right. <coughs> so, uh, my friends, uh, this, I've spoken for long enough. Um, it is, as I say, an extraordinary privilege to be here tonight, but I'm going to leave, if I may, the last word. Not to Margaret Thatcher, uh, but to the man whose portrait you've just seen uh, in the billiard room there, uh, Wing Commander Guy Gibson, who would possibly have been a Conservative Member of Parliament. But that doesn't matter whether you withdrew from then or, or what. Um, he was not a bloodthirsty man. They did not like having to drop the bombs on German cities any more than uh, men like to uh, obliterate villages in Afghanistan uh, today. And in his own book, Enemy Coast Ahead, he said, Why must we make war every 25 years? Why must men fight? How can we stop it? The answer may lie in being strong. Uh, it rests with the people themselves, for it is the people who forget. After many years, they will probably slip and ask for disarmament, so that they can do away with taxes and raise their standard of living. If the people forget, they bring wars on themselves, and they can blame no one but themselves. We must learn about politics. We must vote for the right things and not necessarily the traditional things. We want to see our country remain as great as it is today, forever. It all depends on the people, their common sense, and their memory. Tonight, we pay tribute to those whose memory we honour in this prestigious place here tonight. And to you, Graham, thank you very much for making this, certainly for me, the most special of special events. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah.